November 21st, 1983, Linda Mann would leave her home to go visit a friend. She lived in the village of Narborough in central England. She would not return to her, make it to her friend's home, and her frantic family would find her body the next morning along a beautiful little footpath near her home. Three years later, Dawn Ashworth, leaving a friend's home, trying to return home in a village close to where Linda Mann had lived, the village of Indebury, she, too, would be brutally raped and murdered. Her body would be found two days later. The constables that worked in these villages recognized that they were unable to solve not only the first crime, but now they had a second crime. And they believed, based on the MO, the modus operandi, that the same individual might be responsible for the murder of these two young women, 15-year-olds. Now, fortunately for them, down the road, about six miles, was Dr. Alec Jeffries at the University of Leicester. Now, Dr. Alex Jeffries was a scientist who was very involved in looking at human variation by looking at regions of DNA where variation could occur. And he used restriction enzymes to cut DNA fragments, and he would look at these regions of variation. And one day in September, he came in and he had finished an experiment and he was looking at an autorad similar to the one that we see pictured here. And he looked at these pieces of DNA that he had generated from different individuals, and he saw that he could identify and differentiate between those people. Why is this important? Well, it's important because he realized this could be a tool that could be used for forensic serologists. Because the task of a forensic serologist is to take biological fluids left at crime scenes, such as happened with the rapes of these two young women, look to try to identify who might have left those biological fluids. Because he was so close to this village, he went to the police department and he said, I have a technology that can not only perhaps link those conclusively together, I can look at the DNA left behind to see if it came from the same individual, but I might be able to help you solve it. If you are willing to collect blood samples from potential suspects and send those to me, I'll use my DNA testing to see if I can identify who might be the source. Well, the police, completely flummoxed, were quite willing to take Dr. Alex Jeffries on. They sent in the samples. He did show that these cases were, in fact, linked. Not only did he do that, but he started processing these blood samples that they were collecting from any man between the age of 17 to 34 that lived in one of these small villages that gave a sample that did not have an alibi. Now, as the police were doing their investigation, they did identify a potential suspect. The suspect was a 17-year-old male who knew something about one of the victims. And as they interviewed him for about six or seven hours, at the end of that interview, he confessed to the crime. The police were relieved. They thought, well, we've got our killer. But they decided they needed to confirm it by using Dr. Alex Jeffrey's method. They sent him the samples, and it did not match. He told them, no, this individual has confessed, but in fact is not responsible for the murders of these two girls. And this begins a DNA detective's first aha moment. The DNA was actually used to exclude a person, not inculpate them. Now, there is a good ending to this story. Ultimately, an individual named Colin Pitchfork was identified. His blood samples were sent to Dr. Alex Jeffries, and he confirmed that Colin Pitchfork was, in fact, the source of those semen stains. He later pled guilty to the murders of those two victims. Now, across the pond in 1986, I was this excited scientist. I had my new PhD, and I wanted to be involved in forensic science. Why? because I wanted to do something applied with my science. So I decided to do something maybe a little unusual. I decided to join the FBI. Why? Because if you wanted to be an examiner in the FBI laboratory in those days, you had to be an agent first. So I thought, if I could get through PCHEM at Penn State, man, I could get through Quantico, right? No problem. So that's what I did. I joined the FBI. I spent four years in the Baltimore field office doing investigations. 
And then in 1990, I was assigned to the FBI laboratory, and I got to join some of those DNA agents, the people that were beginning to use this RFLP process that Dr. Alex Jeffries had developed. Now, you might ask, why so much interest in DNA? Well, this is a family picture that shows me and my brother and my parents. And I got to say, when both of your parents are named Jean, you just know you're going to be working on DNA your entire life. So, but I digress. So let's go back to what DNA detectives in the early 90s were able to do. We were able to answer, are these cases related? We were also hopefully able to say, if you gave me a reference sample, I could say, is this person the source of that DNA, or could I exclude them, as Dr. Alex Jeffries had done? We would use the RFLP process. Now, the problem with this process was you needed a lot of DNA. You needed between 50 and 100 nanograms. And that DNA had to be very high quality. Because if Mother Nature had gotten to the DNA ahead of you and had chewed it up, then that initial step of cutting it with the restriction enzyme would fail. It was also a long and laborious product. To get to that final profile that you see up there in blue, it would take me maybe seven days or 10 days to develop the autorad. So this could take us weeks to get to our final results. Now, we changed the process that Dr. Alex Jeffries did slightly. We did not use multi-locus probing. We actually broke it up and used single locus probes to look at these regions of variation. And as you can see in this picture, even though we use different technology now, the simple concept is up there. We look at DNA processed from a victim, and we get a pattern. Then we also look at DNA process, perhaps, from a reference sample from a suspect. And we compare those patterns to the DNA that we get from our evidence. And as you can see in this picture, the DNA pattern in pink from the victim, or I'm sorry, from the suspect, matches the DNA pattern that we get from our evidence. Now, we would do this probing either at four locations or five or six. As the DNA, um, our techniques improved, we were able to do that faster and get more information. But sometimes to get all of this information, it could take me up to 10 or 12 weeks to get a result with this RFLP testing. The other problem with RFLP was, well, actually a good thing about RFLP was we could take this information and we could store this information into databases, just like people were doing with fingerprints. So in this country, we developed something called the Combined DNA Index System. And it was a series of databases that contained DNA profiles from Individuals who'd been arrested for crimes, like rape and murder, convicted offenders, we'd do their DNA typing, we'd store that information, and then we could use it to compare to DNA that we got from evidentiary samples at crime scenes, especially if these were crime scenes in which there were no suspects identified. And the idea would be you'd look at these profiles and compare them to these sources, these reference samples from the convicted offender profiles, and perhaps you could solve the case. Or maybe you could just link cases together. Now, this required legislation being passed in all of these different states. Now, I'm a scientist. I had no idea I was going to have to be involved in worrying about laws. But part of the job of a forensic scientist is to get your head out of the boat every now and then and pay attention to this. So laws had to be passed in each state that said, we will collect these samples, we will generate these profiles, we will store these profiles. Now, the CODIS system exists today. It has a series of state databases that can be tied together at the national level in the National DNA Index System. And most of the DNA testing done to start this was the RFLP test. So now we could answer this question, has someone else done this before? We can reach in, compare our unknown profiles to these convicted offender profiles, and perhaps solve our cases. But here's the problem with RFLP. RFLP, as I said before, it required a substantially large stain, about the size of a quarter. And we often didn't have that on our evidence. So what would happen? Well, a next great development called the polymerase chain reaction came along in the early 90s. PCR allowed us to get DNA in such small amounts that we could target it and amplify those regions of interest, make as much of it as we wanted, and then make our comparisons. The PCR reaction allowed me to look at very small stains and degraded stains. It didn't have to be in that high molecular weight form anymore. Mother Nature could have gotten to it, chewed it up, because I'm going to target smaller regions and still get the information that I need. We know that this process is important to many people. The, the creator of it, Kerry Mollis, got a Nobel Prize for it. And it's just another technology that, as a forensic scientist, I could adopt and use. And suddenly, I could access DNA off the back of a stamp from an extortion letter. 
cigarette butt smoked outside of a, a lookout while somebody was waiting to blow up a car, mask from worn at bank robberies, caps left behind in somebody's car, band-aids, the skin cells on a band-aid, or the saliva left on a Coke bottle or a straw or a cup, perhaps, that's left at a crime scene, even chewing gum. I had a case involving chewing gum, and I was able to get the DNA um, cells from that and process the DNA. Now, the PCR test that we use involves the extraction of DNA, quantitation. It involves several steps, just like RFLP does. But what we do is now we go in and we target short tandem repeat areas, smaller repeat areas, similar to the larger fragments that Dr. Alex Jeffries looked at. These are much smaller. So we do this STR typing. We look at targeted regions. We can take that information. We can put it into CODIS. Um, so the PCR testing method now takes us about one or two days to complete. We still have some questions left to answer, though. For example, a lot of information can be brought forward from bones, human remains, let's say. We want to identify who this individual is. In order to do that, we can't always use nuclear DNA. But methods have been, detect, have been um, created that allows us to look at the mitochondrial DNA that's present in our cells. Now, mitochondria are these really cool organelles within your cells. They're like the batteries of the cell. And they're so critical, they actually have their own gen uh, genetic code, their own little blueprint. And it's a circular piece of DNA that, if sequenced, can help us differentiate between individuals. But it can only help us on a certain level because our mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited. It's not like autosomal nuclear DNA, which you get half from mom and half from dad. You get all of your mitochondrial DNA from your mother, right? So if you have a brother or a sister, you would all have the same mitochondrial DNA as your mother, as her mother, and so on. So we can't differentiate on the same level that we can with nuclear, but it can still be very powerful information because mitochondrial DNA is present in human remains, it's present in the shaft of a hair. So we can access that should we need to use that to do something with the evidence. Now, we are fortunate here at Penn State. I get to work with a guy named Dr. Mitch Holland, who's one of the gurus in mitochondrial DNA testing. He helped develop the forensic test that we use today in many laboratories. He worked at a place called the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory. Their job at AFTO was to identify remains of soldiers from past um, wars. And so they needed to use mitochondrial DNA in order to do this. So he is now here at Penn State doing research, but he's doing research with a new tool. He's looking at the next generation sequencing platforms. Prior to this, mitochondrial DNA has been done by Sanger sequencing. But Dr. Holland, teaming up with Dr. Jennifer McElhoe here, they are looking at these new next generation sequencing approaches to get better information out of the mitochondrial DNA. Because what next generation sequencing allows us to do is do parallel, massively parallel sequence analysis. Whereas with Sanger, you would maybe get two looks at the DNA. With next gen sequencing, we can dig deeper. We can actually look at the same region maybe 30 to 10,000 times. So this capability is being useful in many areas of science, but it's especially interesting to us in forensics. Because what Dr. Holland is able to see are these regions of heteroplasmy. So what a heteroplasmy is, it's actually like a small mixture that might be present within the mitochondrial DNA. Because if you think about it, there are thousands of copies of these in your cells. And so there, on occasion, will be mutations that occur. And if you can look at it more closely, as he can with next generation sequencing, he can see these heteroplasmic events. And why is that important? Because now we might be able to differentiate between maternal relatives. We are actually beginning to see these differences even between siblings and, and children um, of, of their mothers. So this would be great. We could maybe get finer differentiation with this mitochondrial DNA if we're able to use next-gen sequencing. So that's what his research is looking at. Now, my research is slightly different. I'm going to go back to the autosomal DNA because we have this problem, which is demonstrated here from some statistics from the National DNA Index of the CODIS system. 
Here I show you that we have over 10 million profiles from convicted offenders. That's a lot of reference samples. We have about 500,000 cases which have not been solved. So we would hope to solve those by looking at those profiles. Well, fortunately, we have been able to make some connections in about half of those cases. We have been able to link them or perhaps even solve them. But that still leaves over 200,000 cases with, with no end, no end in sight. We don't know who is responsible. So how do we tap into that DNA to determine that? How can we try to look at the DNA and try to figure out what does this source look like? Maybe are there some characteristics I can tell from the DNA that gives me a clue? What do they look like? Where might they be from? What is their ancestry? Are they European? Are they African? Are they Asian? Is that something I can get out of the DNA? So that's what my, my research is focused on. I'm trying to fill this investigative gap with some type of information using next generation sequencing. And I'm gonna focus on regions called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Now, there are thousands of SNPs in our DNA, but some of them are more informative than others. And so that is my job, to help try to figure out which SNPs we should be targeting. But the good news is I'm not going to have to do this alone. I am going to work with or using information that's been generated by other researchers. For example, Dr. Ken and Judy Kidd at Yale have been looking at SNPs that are indicative of ancestry and identity. Dr. Manfred Kaiser, who had actually spent some time here at Penn State, he's actually looking at SNPs that identify and give indications of hair color and eye color. And then, of course, Dr. Mark Shriver, who's here in our anthropology department, he has also identified SNPs that are informative to ancestry, as well as facial characteristics. And so he has a huge project going on in which he's capturing 3D facial images and then digging into the DNA to see which regions might be informative of those characteristics. We're using the MySeq um, next-gen sequencing platform from Illumina. And Illumina, working with them, we have now begun to develop assays that allow us to target at least 57 SNP regions of interest. But the best part about this is, because there are SNP technologies out there, people have been looking at SNPs, but you need a lot of DNA, maybe 250 nanograms of DNA to use those platforms. But with next-gen sequencing, we can target the regions we're interested in, we can get down to forensically relevant levels, maybe one nanogram, just, and, and very small amounts, and that's our hope. We can do this by targeting the SNPs of interest, creating libraries using a TrueSeq approach, which allows us to put sufficient indices on those to separate the samples, as well as to perform the next-gen sequencing. But our ultimate goal is to take these samples, look not only at SNP regions, but look at STR regions, because we want to be compatible with all that information in the database if we can. So we're hoping to generate these large multiplexes that allow us to look at old information as well as new lead informative generation of information. I'd like to finish with a salute to some of our future next generation uh, DNA detectives that have graduated from our program, and also to thank ECOS for this opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you.